Hey everyone, I'm Scott Stokely and this video is going to be everything you need to know about the PDGA rating system. This is going to include how it was developed, why it's calculated the way it is, and just how very good the rating system actually is. Now, don't start commenting yet that I'm wrong because I said it's very good. I didn't say it was perfect. There are also some flaws in the system, which I'm going to discuss. And I'm even going to touch on some of the myths that are out there because some of them are myths, but some of the myths are actually true. So this should be an interesting video. It's going to be a huge challenge for me because I'm going to take something that is inherently based in mathematics and I'm going to attempt to explain it with almost no math whatsoever. So, <laughs> wishing me luck. Now, before I begin, all of my Tour Series merchandise is available at scottstokely.net. I have the Castaplast Berg, the Castaplast Stall, the West Side Harp, more products coming out. I strongly encourage you to go there and buy a ton of them uh, and also get on the mailing list. You'll be notified of clinics, seminars, and more releases. Okay, so I'm going to do something a little different on this video. I'm going to be looking at my notes because we're going to get into the weeds here and there's a lot to unpack. Uh, I'm also going to put on glasses so not only can I read my notes, but I'm also going to try to convince you that I didn't drop out of school when I was 15 years old to play Frisbee every day and that I'm actually smart enough to make a video about this. All right, so for starters, the reason why the ratings exist and they're they're important. There's always a question of wanting to compare players in different parts of the world. Uh, this was a real challenge back in the 90s when they were developed, the rating systems first came out, because players rarely got a chance to compete against one another. You know, at the World Championships, that was the only time that the US players even got to see the Europeans, and it was for one week a year. And all that did is compare a very small group of players over a few rounds of disc golf one time a year. It did nothing for all the other European players and all the US players or players all over the world who weren't at these events. So we always wondered, what is the skill level? How can we compare these players? Well, uh, Chuck Kennedy and Roger Smith first came up with the idea for the rating system in 1998. And the first idea that I'm sure they considered and tossed out immediately, uh, that people still to this day talk about doing, is uh, a system that just simply can't work. And that system would be to rate courses. Simply say, what is that course rated? And then when a player plays that course, you would know what their skill level is. The reason it's impossible is because every course is so radically different. But not only is every course radically different, the same course is radically different every single time you play it. Tee pads change, basket changes, winds change, rain, temperature, competition versus league versus casual play. High grass versus low grass, OP's marked, not, not marked. I mean, you simply cannot give a course a rating. There is no system that would allow you to say, well, when you move a basket uh, 30 feet back, that accounts for X percentage of strokes more difficult. It just, you, you can't do it. <clears throat> so, the only way to compare players would be to compare players against other players and using that metric. Well, that has inherent challenges as well, but they came up with an incredibly brilliant system to solve this. So I said I was gonna talk about very little mathematics. Uh, we're gonna step aside for a second. There is one mathematical concept you have to understand. So forget disc golf for a minute. If you can understand this mathematical concept, 
the rest of the video is going to make sense. If you can't, it won't. So, again, forget this golf for a minute. Uh, there is a concept in mathematics called the regression to the mean. And all that means is that the larger the sample size you get, the more predictable the results will be. Easiest example. Everyone knows if you flip a coin 10 times, on average, it's going to come up heads 5 times out of 10. But we also know if you flip it 10 times, it can come up any number between 1 and 10. It's more likely to come up 5 than 6. It's more likely to come up 6 than 7. More likely to come up 7 than 8, etc. But really, any number can come up. So you can flip a coin 10 times, for example. It could come up heads 7 times. And you really wouldn't think it was that weird. It's not that weird, mathematically. However, <clears throat> excuse me, you flip a coin a hundred times, it is extremely unlikely that it would come up heads 70 times. It's not going to fall that far from 50 when you have a larger sample size. In fact, it would rarely come up heads more times than 60 or fewer times than 40. It's getting closer to that 50 average. But 60 and 40 can still happen in 100 flips. Flip a coin a thousand times. It is effectively, mathematically, never going to come up 600 or 400 times heads. It's going to be more like 480 or 520. The larger the sample size, the more data that comes in, the closer and closer it's going to get to average. That's all you have to understand. It's a mathematical certainty that that's the case. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so now let's go back to disc golf. When the ratings were first created, uh, it was at the 1998 World Championships, and they started with a, a starting point of saying, well, we want top pros to have around 1,000 ratings. Or, or a thousand rating. I mean, you, you needed a baseline starting number. Uh, the reason why it started at a thousand was because if you did a smaller number, such as a hundred, then the top players would be a uh, thousand five rated, and that's really close. That, that'd be like a thousand rated player compared to a thousand fifty rated player, but only five different tiers in between that a player could fit into. That's not detailed enough. There's a lot more range between a thousand rated player and Paul and Ricky. So instead, <clears throat> excuse me, they needed a big enough number to, to create a more accurate representation. So a thousand was the starting place. I, but that is actually probably not that important, but that's where it started. Then what they did is they said, uh, 600 rounds of golf are gonna be played at each course. Let's take the top 100 of the 600 rounds what is the average score of the top 100? And we'll call that 1,000 rated. Doesn't matter what number they started with. It just had to be a baseline. And it was a nice round number. We now have 1,000 rated. Then all you had to do was compare every player in the field to how many strokes above or below that course rating that those top 100 scores had uh, created and assign a certain number of points, ratings points per stroke to see where players ended up. Not by score, but by this rating system. Uh, I'll put up something on the screen, I hate to do it because it's just one more example of Ken Climo beating me and me finishing second place. But uh, the very first ratings that came out, I was the, the second highest rated player for them, uh, which I actually, in hindsight, I think is really neat. But that was the ratings from the very first tournament. Now, at this point, you don't know anything about players around the world. You only know about this very small group of players, a very small sample size, eight rounds of golf, which is also very small, but you have a starting point, you have data. Then what happened is you could take those players and now they spread out back to their home courses or the tournaments they play. And now when they start to play tournaments, they're by the way, they're called propagators. Now, since they have this initial established rating, when they play a course at a tournament, 
for that specific round, because remember conditions change, so it's round by round, those propagators can establish what that course rating is. Now, if you understand regression to the mean, you can see there's already a flaw in this, which is one or two players at a tournament who happen to be at the World Championships is a very small sample size. There can be a wide range of them playing good and them playing bad. So you don't get really accurate data at this point with the course ratings, but you get a starting place. And once you have a starting place, you have players that played at that tournament and then played other tournaments where more propagators are at. Next thing you know, those other players get, uh, they started with a baseline of eight rounds. Those eight rounds, you become a propagator. So now progressively over time, more and more tournaments had more and more propagators. The data size increased. It started to get more accurate. So even though the system was going to be inherently very flawed at the beginning, just wait for the data to start coming in. The more the data that comes in, the closer and closer it's going to get to predicting these things, predicting the results. So now fast forward a little bit and you have tournaments with let's say 50 propagators at them. This is where regression to the mean comes in. You have 50 players playing a course. One player might shoot well above or below their average. 10 players, some will shoot above their average, some will shoot below. But with 10 players, they're gonna mostly cancel themselves out. Not perfectly, but mostly you're gonna to start to get a course average. Well, you get 20 propagators, 30, 40, 50 or more at a tournament. Regression to the mean says that with, with a number that large, those players are gonna play that course really close to what they would average on that course when you combine all the numbers together. It's, uh, it's actually incredibly accurate. And you can demonstrate this mathematically, not just in disc golf, but in many, many other areas. The math works. So that round, every tournament round, gets a course rating. It's called an SSA, it doesn't matter, but uh, that course gets a rating for that round that is accurate because the number of players, propagators that are there. And then when you play a tournament, that course has a rating based on the average score of players of the ratings they currently have. And then your rating is basically how many strokes above or below that rating you scored. And it depends on, there's you know, a lot of math that's going on behind the scene, but let's say seven to 10 or seven to 12 strokes, depending on the tournament. I'm sorry, seven to 12 ratings points per stroke. That's why if the player in your card shoots one stroke better, they might score nine ratings points above you. Might be seven, might be 10, but you know, somewhere around there. At that tournament, that's how much a stroke is worth. And again, <clears throat> excuse me. And again, the system is accurate. Now, it's not perfect, okay? It's not perfect because there are some inherent flaws. The first flaw is that as good as 50 propagators would be, a thousand propagators would be better. A thousand propagators would be within probably a 20th of a stroke of their average. Just, I mean, I haven't done the math, but it would be almost perfect. But that's not reasonable. You only have a certain number, but you have to understand 50 is good enough to be very accurate. Another flaw in the system is that Players have different skill levels at different types of courses. So there are players out there that are very good finesse players, but they have no power, or they're very good in the woods. Other players are good in the open. You have uh, <laughs> smart strategic players that are great at playing courses with OBs because they manage the course well, and some players that don't. Different skill sets. Well, if a player only plays a certain type of course that matches their skill set, they will have a rating that's disproportionately higher than it should be relative to the field at large. So for example, a player that only plays uh, short wooded courses because they're a finesse woods golfer, if that's all they play, 
their rating would be basically the same as a player who plays all sorts of different courses, but then takes, you know, half of their worst rated tournaments and just tosses them out and takes their rating from their 50% of the tournaments where they played their best. Because that Woods player isn't playing the other equal number of tournaments on more challenging courses for them. So it's going to be skewed. There's no real way around this. I mean, there are some ways, but it, like as soon as you toss them out, I can just poke holes in them. I mean, so there's really not a good system. It's just one of the flaws. Um, another one, uh, this comes up a lot on the Pro Tour, is that <clears throat> there can be radically different conditions between the morning and the afternoon. Well, when you have a staggered start, you have a player teeing off at eight in the morning in dead calm, and a player teeing off at two in the afternoon with 15 mile an hour winds, they're playing two different courses. Or it could be no wind, but it's 35 degrees at eight o'clock in the morning and it's 65 in the afternoon. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that can cause this. Remember the entire field that day, the way the system is set up right now anyways, the entire field is determining what that course rating is. And the afternoon players who are playing in the wind, on average you can play, let's say three strokes worse than the ones playing in the morning. Well, if that's the case, then effectively a player's rating when they play in the morning would be a stroke and a half better than they actually shot as far as what the ratings represent. There's no real, real way around this. A player who plays in the wind, who looks at their rating and says, I think I played this level, but my rating wasn't what didn't represent what I shot, I got screwed. They, they did for one round. Um, the reason they didn't actually get screwed is because over the course of a season, there's gonna be an equal number of times <laughs> that, they're, that they're getting the benefits of the morning round and they get a ratings boost. Um, it's human nature. We don't remember those times. <laughs> like we don't look at that rating and think, well, oh wow, I got rated this, but I really didn't shoot that well. Like that's not how we think. So the fact is it evens itself out over time. So the flaws in the system are there, but it doesn't mean the system's not incredibly good. Now, there's some myths out there I wanna chat about because some of them are myths, but some of them are actually true. Uh, and in, in all of these cases, by the way, this is what's great. Uh, I can't be wrong. <laughs> uh, the thing about math is that if it's interpreted correctly, math trumps everything. If the math says one thing and I have a different opinion what, than what the math says, I'm wrong. Just fact. So I'm gonna talk about things mathematically that are just a fact. Uh, regardless of how it feels, this is truth. Uh, so the first myth, the myth of the ratings killer. Uh, you have a tournament where everyone's 970 rated or below and a 1020 player comes up, plays the tournament. It's a myth. There's no such thing as a ratings killer. The 1020 player, if there's say 50 propagators in a tournament, doesn't do any more to contribute to the course rating than any other player. They all contribute 2% to that course rating. Actually, the reality is uh, the 1020 player Actually, if there was a ratings killer, would be the least ratings killer mathematically in the entire field because the better you are, the better your rating is, the more predictable your scores become. A, a 10 20 player rarely shoots more than three strokes above or three strokes below their average. They stay really close, they're very consistent. An 880 player can shoot 10 strokes above or, or 10 strokes below. That's what would be effectively a ratings killer. It's not because 50 propagators, remember, they all cancel themselves out. But there is no such thing as a ratings killer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another big myth. A lot of people think the ratings have failed them when they don't get the ratings that they want. Or the most common thing for this is, uh, a player shoots a par in the morning and it's 950 rated. Then they shoot a par in the afternoon and it's 940 rated. Nearly everyone will say there's a problem with the ratings. It wasn't. Remember, those 50 or more propagators, 
gave a very predictable score to what that course should be played. Regression to the mean, that's what that says. So if you shoot the same score and your rating is 10 points below, all that means is that the course played about a stroke easier. Now you might say, well, how could a course play a stroke easier in the afternoon? The conditions were identical. They're never identical, ever. Uh, maybe in the morning it was chilly for the first, you know, three or four holes before the weather picked up. You don't remember it, it wasn't much. That affects things a little bit. And there was probably a little bit of dew on the ground. And because of that dew, you didn't get quite as good a footing on your approach shots, players. Uh, they probably didn't warm up as much because it's a little bit chilly and it's a little bit wet. Uh, maybe the wind uh, was very similar, but it was on average a third of a mile per hour slower in the afternoon. And then, of course, you take into account that there are players that are from out of town at the tournament that were playing the course for the first time. But now that they've seen the course, they're going to play slightly better. When you factor in all these different things, it's easy to see how the entire field may have shot in the course a stroke better. Stroke's not that much. So it's easy to see that if the field shot a stroke better, but you shot the same, you actually shot a stroke worse. Of course, you shot a par both times. It feels like the same round, but really relative to the field, you should have shot on average a stroke better, on average. Now, again, this is just human nature. Like nobody, like nobody looks at that and the ratings being lower the second round like and feels good about it. I don't, I mean, of course not. Uh, thing you have to keep in mind, for every time that's happened, there's an equal number of times where you shoot the same score and your ratings uh, are 10 points higher the second round. It just happens, right? So it averages itself out. Uh, just, we tend to forget the times that it benefited us. And we, <laughs> we remember the times where we feel like we got screwed. Um, okay, here's a good one. Rated league nights. Uh, you ever wonder why you have a top pro in town and you invite them out to league night, uh, a rated league night, and they don't play? They're not being snobs. They're not being antisocial. They're not, like, there's really good reason for this because this is not a myth. A rated league night is a ratings killer or can be, well, can be slash is for a high rated player. The reason why is remember, the field determines the course rating. Well, at league night, you have an entire field almost entirely made up of players who are locals. They're going to play the course a few strokes better disproportionate to their skill level because this is the course they play every single week. That doesn't have a whole lot of effect on a traveling player. A touring pro, pretty darn good at figuring a course out and executing the shots. But if you're a newer player, that home course advantage is massive. Several strokes around massive. Not only that, at league night, it's a more casual setting. There's no pressure from the PDGA tournament. There's no stress, there's no anxiety. The field as a whole will play better, which means the touring player shoots the score they would have shot, but the field shoots three strokes better, that's going to pull your rating down like 20 points. So if Ricky comes out and shoots what felt like a 10-50 round, it probably comes in at like 10-30, 10-28 or something at that league night. And if you care about ratings, and I'll get to it at the end, there's reasons why you, you, you do, especially when it comes to sponsorships and things like that, ratings. Whether or not you think they should matter, they do. And so when a player doesn't come out, they have good reason for it. They're ratings killers. Um, by the way, this is the same thing holds true uh, for just playing easy courses at tournaments. When a course is easy and players are shooting closer and closer to 18 under par, like, you know, forget the occasional ace, those are just random, but a perfect round, the closer you get, the fewer of uh, fewer number of scores that a good player can separate themselves from a lower rated player, right? I mean, you have a, if you play a tournament where the 970 players are shooting, you know, 10 under par, well, what's a top player supposed to do? How many strokes better than that can they shoot even on an easy course? Now, I'll give you an example. I played a tournament last year 
in Hastings, Minnesota. Uh, by the way, an absolute gem of a town. This is one of the little coolest places we've been to in the entire country. It's so awesome. But they have a, a, an easy course. It's a pretty routine course. 19 holes. I shot a 15 under and a 17 under on a 19 hole course. Now I played well, but 15 under, 17 under for 19 holes. My 15 under was rated 1,009. My 17 under for 19 holes was rated 1,028. Now, I don't care how good you are and how easy the course is, there's no player in the world that's gonna be upset shooting 17 under for 19 holes. You still had to execute 17 good shots. Well, can you imagine a 1050 player at that tournament shooting, let's say, back-to-back -back 17 unders and coming in at 1,028, 1,028? Ratings killer. If you care about your ratings, you kind of have to not play those tournaments. Uh, I think there's a solve in there somewhere, but if there is, I don't know what it is. Remember, I dropped out of high school. <laughs> uh, but uh, if there is a solve, it, it hasn't been put into place yet. So those are those last two aren't myths. There are some realities. There are some flaws in the system. But overall, what Chuck and Roger did was it's astonishing like how actually good the ratings are and the numbers play this out like if you compare the data between a thousand five rated player and a thousand twenty rated player if they competed at enough events together on tour together and they've competed at 20 events this year go look at the stats how often does a thousand twenty player beat the thousand five player it's not gonna be 20 out of 20 but it's not gonna be 10 out of 20 the higher rated player will beat the lower rated player the majority of the time. The larger the gap in ratings, the higher the percentage that player beats the lower rated player. The ratings work. I mean, this is almost sacrilege because they're so controversial, but, but the, the data shows that the ratings are actually very good. But like I talked about, there's flaws. But it doesn't mean it's not good. All right. Now the final question is, do ratings matter? Yeah, I no, yes, maybe. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, no, they don't matter. But you could also say, does the score at the disc golf tournament matter? Well, no, it doesn't matter in the real world. I mean, none of it matters in the real world, but it matters because you're playing a sport. It's one of the metrics used to gauge your performance. Your rating, or your score in a course are just two different ways of measuring how you shot. Like one is more definitive than the other because the other has a little margin for error, but they're the same thing. Comparing ratings is no different than comparing scores at a tournament. To me, it's fun. It's fun to talk about over dinner. Or it's fun to talk about players' ratings going up and down. It's fun to post when your rating went up. It's fun to, uh, or not fun, what's the right word? Uh, it's easy to forget to post your ratings when they went down. But when your ratings goes up, everyone's posting to Facebook and everybody's like, that's cool. Like if, it, if they didn't matter, why is everybody doing that? Of course they're fun. Uh, they could matter for sponsorship, even though I made a video why that should matter when it comes to sponsorship. People do still pay attention to stuff like that. It, it, it's certainly a way of quantifying improvement. And the single most important part of all though, is it is the best thing we got to compare players from different parts of the world. Like it's not a perfect system to determine division, but it's far better than anything else because without the rating system, division's determined by someone saying, eh, you go in that division. <laughs> like, like we had nothing before. Now we have something that at the very least is really good. So I'm a fan of the rating system. The majority of people who actually are like math nerds like the rating system because they can see how it works. Even with the flaws, they can also see. They see how it works. So I enjoy them. I think they're awesome. Most important, I hope I explained them well. Uh, this was kind of tricky. Uh, I did my best, but uh, I hope that I hope I demystified them a little bit because if you understand them, they're even cooler uh, than just looking at a number. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, post to your social media, post this video, share it, tell people about it, subscribe. 
Uh, but honestly, sharing the video is where I get uh, the most new viewers. And if you made it all the way to the end, now's the perfect time to go to scottstokely.net and spend money. That's my suggestion. Thanks, everyone.